Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. Glad you're here. If you're joining us uh, in the fellowship hall, good morning. We're glad you're here. If you're joining us online, good morning. We're glad you're here. Wherever you are, we're glad you're where you are Um, because you wouldn't be here. But if you're here, we're glad you're here. We are beginning a a new discussion this morning. Um, We're going to have a conversation over the next couple of weeks about this idea of to gather. Not together, but to gather. Um, In John chapter 4, a very, very familiar passage um, comes to mind. It's a passage that we oftentimes go to when we talk about worship. John chapter 4 is, of course, where we get the dialogue between Jesus and the woman in the well about worship and spirit and truth. But right off the bat, this, this woman finds Jesus and she sees Jesus. She interacts with Jesus. Jesus tells her all about her life, things that probably nobody else knew. And she immediately understands that, that Jesus is more than just man. Okay, And then in John chapter 4, verse 19, this conversation kind of shifts. It shifts from the personal aspect of her life more towards, okay, let's talk theology for a little bit, Jesus. Okay, I don't have a, uh, a remote up here, so you guys are on it this morning. There we go. I don't, oh, there it is. John chapter 4, starting in verse 19. Let me get over there. Here's this conversation that takes place. She says, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Classic understatement again. (laughs) Yeah, a little bit of a prophet. And her question is this, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where, where people ought to worship. So this woman of Samaria, she's got a past. Jesus has been talking to her, and all of a sudden, there's all kinds of speculation of how this even comes up. Maybe she wants to deflect the conversation away from herself and onto something else, but she brings up a very valid point. You see, the Samaritans worshipped in this location. The Jews worshipped in in Jerusalem, and her question is, which one's right? I want to be right. Don't we all? Don't we all? We want to be right. I mean, really, I mean, none of us set out to want to be wrong, but she's got a legitimate question. Which one? And Jesus is going to go into this discussion. We sing this song, we shall assemble on the mountain. This is, this is the question she asks. Which, which mountain is right to assemble on? Which one do I go to? Now, we may come back later to Jesus' answer. Matter of fact, I'm sure we will in the course of this uh, discussion we're entering into. But this morning, I kind of want to focus on something that she doesn't say. You see, she asks which one is right. But the question she doesn't ask at all is why do we even have to assemble? As a matter of fact, she assumes it. She assumes we're going to be together, but where do we need to be together? This mountain Or that mountain. You see, in her culture, it had been ingrained in her that the people of God, the people who were coming to worship God, came together. It was a part of their history. Matter of fact, she'll go on to mention her father's, not talking about necessarily her just her dad, but her dad or granddad. In other words, historically, we've been over here. Historically, you Jews gathered down there. This idea of coming together was not new to her. As a matter of fact, she assumes it. Now, there, there, believe it or not, there are some people in, in our Christian culture today that have a real problem with the song we just sang. Okay? We shall assemble on the mountain, we shall assemble at the throne with humble hearts into his presence. Yeah, they got a problem with it. Because into that song is interjected a Jewish ideology or an Israelite ideology that they don't believe is present in first century Christianity. Matter of fact, their idea is we've, we've totally run away from our historical roots of Israel. Now we're doing something completely different in the New Testament. It's almost like the left side of your Bible is wrong and the right side of your Bible is right. And the God of the right side of your Bible just came along to show you how wrong the God of the left side of the Bible is. But let me just tell you this morning, the God of the left is the same as the God of the right. There's no difference. 
And we have to understand, as we get into this, this discussion of, of a symbol, of gathering, of God's people coming together, that, that we have to, we cannot divorce ourselves from the historical roots of Israel and how Israel understood the importance of coming together. Now, I don't think I'm stepping out of line when I say that most of us, when we, when we assemble as the gathered people of God, that we believe we come into the very presence of God. I've been taught that since I was a little kid. And I think we understand that. And I certainly hope you believe that because you just affirmed that in the song you just sang. Right? The words were, we shall assemble on the mountain, we shall assemble at the throne with humble hearts. Where? Into his presence we bring an offering of song. Now, I, I firmly believe that our belief, our theology, if you will, about presence, the way we understand it today, is rooted and grounded in an understanding of presence that comes from the Old Testament. The New Testament writers basically assume, Jesus assumes a theology, an understanding of, of Christian assemblies, of Christian gatherings, based upon what Israel had done. And I think we will see, as we work through this conversation, a, a definitive continuity between what they did and what we do as it pertains to this idea of coming together. And we need to understand that when Israel came together, they had in their mind that as they came together into the presence of God, it was sacred space. It was a place where God met them, and it became sacred. So in order to set our understanding for this, I want to I kind of walk through a little bit of Old Testament history so that we can appreciate this idea of assembly or gathering as it relates to the people of God. And I think if we do so, and we're intentional, very intentional about looking at presence as it relates to God, as he relates to us, I think we'll see the importance it has in our lives both personally and spiritually okay so if you got your bibles we're going to start in genesis okay genesis chapter one in genesis chapter one in the beginning god the triune god the trinity itself is together they create the heavens and the earth and on that earth god cultivated this place this paradise that, that we call eden this this place was perfect for for the crowning jewel of his creation which was man and woman he makes it perfect for them. It would feed them. It would, it would do everything they needed it to do. But the other thing it did, it provided a place for, for man, for man and woman to exist with God. That was it. Matter of fact, you remember the story. They walked and talked with God in the cool of the evening. They existed in a harmonious relation. Matter of fact, all creation existed in a harmonious relationship then. Man was in harmony with woman. People were in harmony with the animals. They all were in harmony with God. It was just, man, it was kumbaya every day. Right? It was good. It was perfect. It was perfect. Eden is where shalom Peace begins, humans with God. This was, this was the original sacred space, if you will. The original place where God and mankind communed together. You know, it's funny, all throughout Scripture, the Old Testament writers use this, these, these architectural symbols in, in relating to God, in relating to the garden. If you've got your Bibles, let's go to Job chapter 38. This is, this is pretty interesting. In, in talking of, of creation, I want you to just listen to this. Starting in verse 4. This is, this is God speaking, by the way, to Job. And he says this, he says, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched out the line upon it? Or where was its basis sunk? Who laid its cornerstone? Look at verse 8. Who shut in the area, who shut in the sea with doors? 
And when it bursts out from the womb, look verse 10, and prescribe limits for it and set bars and doors. Drop down to verse 22. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or have you seen the storehouses of the hail? Over and over and over again, all throughout Old Testament, we, we see these images, cornerstones, doors, bars, storehouses, foundations, measurements. They're all descriptive of something physical, a physical structure, a physical building. And when you go back and you examine the Hebrew, what they're talking about, it's temple language. It's divine space language. And God, in describing the earth, is talking about architecturally, guess what? This whole place is my temple. And we see that borne out in Eden. We see that borne out. The earth was God's temple. The solar system was God's temple. It's where he existed. Adam and Eve existed with him. It was a temple or divine place. His divine place was the garden of God, as Ezekiel calls it in chapter 31. And, and understand this. Life existed in the temple of God. In other words, think about this for a minute. Adam and Eve had no need to go to the temple to worship. They had no need to build an altar to worship. Why? Because they lived in the temple of God. They lived in the holy palace of God in Eden. Because everything that God created was his. It was his. And they existed in this harmonious, beautiful relationship together. And they had direct communion with God. And then Genesis 3 happens. <laughs> and Adam and Eve by virtue of their sin, basically vandalize the temple of God. And they get kicked out. And they get kicked out. That's important to note that the expulsion from this, this sacred space of the garden did not mean the end of humanity's connection to God. As a matter of fact, this is, this is one of the most intriguing things about God and about his word, where we see that the God... God pursued those who were expelled in order to draw them back into community with him. I mean, think about this for a minute. They're in community in, in Eden, and God has to expel them because of their sin. Now, what would we do if we kicked somebody out of our house? Think about it. What would you do? Would you chase them into the front yard and then do everything you could to get them to come back in? No. They come into your house, tear it up. You, want, you, you say, get out, and you want to stay out. But you know what God does? You tore up my temple. You brought sin into my temple. Get out. And as soon as they're out, what does he do? He pursues them. He pursues them in a way to say, you know what? I know you're out, but I still want community with you. I still want relationship with you. I still want to be together with you. So we move ahead. I know we're going fast. We move ahead to Genesis 12. And God calls a man by the name of Abraham out of, out of this paganism that he's living in in the land of Ur. Okay? With the sole intent of once again restoring the intimacy that was lost in the garden. Listen to the promise in verse 2 and 3 of Genesis chapter 12. He says this, I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. Blessed. Abraham goes on, and when he gets to where God wants him to go, he stops, and he builds an altar, and he worships. An altar to commemorate, once again, God's presence in his life. And, and the amazing thing about, about Abraham is everywhere he goes, everywhere he stops, everywhere he encounters God, he builds an altar, and he worships. He does it at Bethel in Genesis 12. He does it at Hebron in Genesis 12. Also, he does it at Mount Moriah in Genesis chapter 22. It's almost everywhere Abraham encounters God, he builds an altar. And it's almost as if Abraham's planting a flag and he's declaring, this land belongs to the Lord. It's his. And in each place, a, a space was carved out, so to speak, where once again, humans could come together into the very presence of of God and commune with him. It's almost like every time Abram builds an altar, he's carving out another little piece of Eden where, where they can once again commune with God. But understand this patriarchal altar was temporary. 
It was a temporary solution to living outside of communion with God. But God has a plan to once again restore his world as as sacred space through fellowship. Now with a community of people, not just families. Don't forget, although sin tore apart the shalom that was in Eden, God is deeply involved in restoring it. So he hears the cries of his people later. And I know we've jumped who are now in captivity in Egypt. And in Exodus chapter 2, we get these great words, starting in verse 23. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry to rescue from slavery came, came up to God, and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abram, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God saw the people of Israel God knew. And I could spend a long time right there just on those two words. God knew, but still. So God sends Moses. You know the story. You know the story, the story of the Exodus. Moses goes to Pharaoh, the plagues. You remember all of that. But let me just say this. If all you get out of the story of the Exodus is a bunch of freed people from slavery, you've completely missed the point of it. You see, God's redemptive gold, God's purpose to redeem Israel, God's purpose to redeem mankind is a life of worshipful communion with God himself. That's what was lost in Eden. That's what he wants back. He wants to bring us back into a state of worshipful communion with him, worshipful relationship with him. God declares his very purpose for them in the very next chapter. Look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 12. He, God said this, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. He's talking to Moses. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, what? You shall serve God on this mountain. Now, understand, we've talked about this before. You go all the way through the worship language of the Bible. You see two words over and over again. You see serve, you see worship. They're used almost interchangeably. But God declares here, when you get them to the mountain, their purpose before me is not just to serve, but it's in a worshipful way. We're going to interact with one another again. God is bringing his people. People back into community. The Exodus story is a journey initiated and carried out by God, a journey into the divine presence of God. He's bringing his, his people back into his presence. Listen to him. Jump over to verse nine, chapter 19. Look what he says here. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Understand this statement by God to Israel is just chocked full of theology for their faith. Okay? The first thing you have to understand from it is who's taking the initiative in this process. And it's God all the way. It's God. I mean, look at the words. I did. I bore you. I brought you. God is saying, listen, I'm the one doing this. Again, he's the one chasing the guys that, that robbed the house. He's the one chasing them into the front yard, begging to get them back in. This is God pursuing Israel and saying, listen, I want you back with me. This isn't a story about Israel. This isn't a story about Moses. This is a story about God. It's a story about God. It's a story about a God who brought a people. And understand, here's the, here's the thing. From Genesis to Revelation, this is the story of God. God brings people who are beyond redemption, and he brings them into communion with himself. That is the gospel message in a nutshell. He takes people who are beyond, completely beyond redemption, and he brings them into intimacy with himself. And he does it for a reason. Matter of fact, within that, we get Israel's vocation, their purpose for existing as community, their purpose for existing as nation. In the text, he says, you are to live sanctified life. You're going to live that life before me. Israel's very existence as a nation is a living sacrifice. Sound like New Testament language to me. Go to Romans. Okay? 
She's to be a kingdom of priests. In other words, every Israelite a priest. Israel is to be set apart, sanctified from the world for a very specific purpose. It indicates Israel's unique role and purpose was not just for themselves. It was for the world at large. In other words, when people saw Israel, they, the people were supposed to see God. That was the purpose for Israel. Now, let me just ask you real quick. Are you beginning to see the correlation between Israel and the church today? Israel was to exist. Her purpose in the world was to declare the praise of God. Isaiah says this in Isaiah 43, 21. He says, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise and ultimately lead the world into the praise of God. They were to live out their lives on display in front of the nations. Israel was to demonstrate to all what it means to experience the holy presence of God. In other words, Israel had times to come and gather and assemble in the presence of God, and that should change who they are. That's to the point that when they went out and lived their lives, people would notice a difference. What's wrong with you? Or what's right with you? What's right with me? I have been in the very presence of God himself. Do you see, the, do you see it yet? You see our existence today. Our purpose today in this world, in this community, in this time is to declare God's praise. Our very purpose is to lead the world into the praise of God. And I know right off the bat, some of you are going to go, wait a minute, no, our purpose is the Great Commission. Our purpose is to go into all the world and preach and teach and baptize. That You know what? You're exactly right. To what end? To what end, though? You see, what happens when you teach and baptize folks they become followers of Jesus who do what praise God the end result you see the great commission is a step towards the end result that what God wants people who come into divine presence with him and worship him as who he is and live in community and intimacy with him now understand we get hung up in the middle instead of focusing on the end and the end says simply this we are people created to be in the essence and intimacy and presence of God Almighty. What do you think heaven's going to be? Eternity in the presence of God. Folks, this is, this, is, this is practice for the game. This is practice for the game. And as, as such, we today, church, we are called to live out our lives on display before all around us. We, as the church of the living God, the church of the resurrected Jesus Christ, is to demonstrate to all around us what it means to experience the holy presence of God. Now, let me ask you this. Why did you come? Why are you here? You ever think about that? Because see, some, some people will come because I have to. I have to. God's going to strike me dead, or God's going to send me to hell if I don't go up. If I, if I don't show up, I've got to go. And on the other side, on the other side, all the way to the other end of the equation, you got folks, why do you go? Man, I got great friends there. I want to go see them. I want to go hang out. I want to fellowship. I want to be encouraged. And you know what? In one sense, Neither one is really wrong. Does God want us to be together? Does God want us to assemble together? Has he made it clear in his word that we as his church are to come together? Yes, he has. So in an essence, God wants us to be together. At the same time, when we come together, do we, are we encouraged? Are we built up by those that, that we come in contact with, our friends, our loved ones, our brothers and sisters in Christ? Is it encouraging? Sure, but let me tell you something. Those are all byproducts to living and experiencing the presence of God when you come. If you come, when you assemble together as the church of God, if your primary focus 
is I've got to do it or I'm going to hell, or my primary focus is, oh, I want to go see my buddy so-and-so, then you've missed the point because your primary focus of being here is to experience the presence of God. That's what we do. And I know some of you are in your minds right now, you've already, you've already backed out of this and you're saying, well, I can experience the presence of God by myself. Yeah, you can. You can. As a matter of fact, when you come to Jesus Christ and you're baptized into Jesus Christ, Acts 2 promises us that, that God will deposit within us a part of himself in the form of the Spirit. Yes, you can experience God. And I pray that you are experiencing God every day. But let me also say, as we work through these texts in the next couple of weeks, there are certain things that can only take place when God's people gather together. There are certain things that God does when we come together, when we assemble. Ultimately, it's been God's plan from the beginning to redeem his people back into a sense of community and fellowship with him that was lost in the garden. To gather together us as his people. And will this, will this ultimately and completely be fulfilled when we're in heaven? Yes, it will. It will. We will experience the presence of God every single moment for eternity. But we don't have to wait for eternity to experience the presence of God today. You know, next week, we're going to take this even further, even deeper. We're going to take Israel up the mountain of God. And there's some really amazing things that happen when Israel comes face to face with her God on the mountain. But today, as we, the people of God, have gathered, as, as we have assembled this morning, if you have experienced the presence of God through your worship, through your communion this morning, Great words this morning, by the way, Kelly. Thank you for leading our thoughts. If you've experienced God this morning, then go out and live your life on display in front of the community and in front of the world, telling people, showing people that, you know what? I know what it means to experience the presence of God. Live it out in the presence of your family. Live it out in the presence of your coworkers, in the presence of your neighbors, in the presence of the world. But live it out in a way that makes it obvious to those who are around you that there is something different about you. Today, if you're not in a relationship with God through Jesus, know that it has been his plan from the garden to redeem. That simply just what word just simply means to buy back those who have been contaminated by sin, to redeem, again, the unredeemable back into communion and intimacy with himself. And he did that by sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins, sins you could not pay for. You do that by changing who is in control of your life to participate in Jesus' own death, burial, and resurrection by being baptized and then living a life and entering into and abiding in the very presence of God in your life. This morning... I guess my, my exhortation to you is simple. If you've experienced God, live like it. This morning, if you need anything, if you need to respond to the gospel, if you need prayers of this congregation, we'll have shepherds in the back, we'll have shepherds in the front. Let us know how we can help you as we stand, as we sing.